Okay, we are introducing inverse functions today. And inverse functions essentially undo each other. Meaning, if I take the composition of the inverse, my output is x. And if I plug in my function to the inverse, the output is also x. So, we find the inverse by swapping the x and the y in the function and then solving for y. So remember, f of x is the same thing as our y values. So if I rewrote this as y equals x minus 4, that's the same thing. So to find my inverse, I'm going to swap the x and the y and then solve for y. So y equals x plus 4 is my inverse. Same thing over here. Remember, f of x is y. So y equals x cubed plus 1. I'm going to swap my x's and my y's and then get y by itself. So x minus 1 equals y cubed. And then you cube root both sides. So cube root of x minus 1. Okay, those are the inverses from example 1. Now to verify that two functions are inverses of each other, we can do this algebraically. So f of g has to be x and g of f has to be x in order for functions to be inverses of each other. And we verify this by taking the composition f of g and the composition g of f. So let's start this here. First let's take f of g. Remember that just means I'm substituting g into my function f. So 1 fourth x, sorry, 1 fourth, got ahead of myself here. We're plugging in g here. So 12 plus 4x minus 3. So I distribute that 1 fourth and we get 3 plus 4x minus 3. The 3 and negative 3 cancel. And I apologize, that's not 4x don't know where my head is. 1 fourth times 4 is just 1. So that's 1x. And we're left with x. So that one checks out. Then we have to do it the other way around where we plug in f to our g function. So that 12 carries down. Distribute that 4. Get x minus 12. 12 and minus 12 cancel, and we're left with x. So f and g are, in fact, inverses of each other, and we just proved that. Let's practice that again. Here I have two more functions, f and g. So remember, I need to show that f of g equals x and g of f equals x. So first, f of g, we're going to plug in. 1 third x plus 2. When I distribute that 3, I get x plus 6. And then when I add my constants, I end up with x plus 4. And this does not equal x. So f and g are not inverses. Because I did not get just x by itself as a result. So down here is just some more practice finding the inverses. So x is 5y minus 7. x plus 7 equals 5y. And so y equals x plus 7 over 5 is my inverse. On part b, x equals 3y cubed. So I divide by 3. And then I take the cube root of both sides. And so we get the cube root of x over 3. And now both of those, we could verify that we did this correctly by taking the composition both ways. And that would be how we verify that we found the inverse correctly. Okay. Then part C, I swap my x's and my y's. And I get that y is equal to the square root of x. Now remember, when we take the square root, it's positive or negative. Now I can't have two inverse functions. So that means that this function, x squared, does not have an inverse. There is no inverse for that function. 
And on the next page, we're going to talk about how we would know that graphically. But for now, if I end up with two possible answers for my inverse function, there is no inverse function because this is not a function. It would fail the vertical line test. Okay. The last page, graphing inverses, is a lot easier than it sounds. Let's start by first graphing our initial function, 2x minus 3. The y-intercept is negative 3, and my slope is 2, so I'm just going to go up 2 and over 1 a couple different times just to get some points on my graph and then connect them. So there's my initial graph, and if I make a table of these values, that would be 0, negative 3, that would be 1, negative 1, 2, positive 1, 3, positive 3, and 4, positive 5. So those are just some points on my initial graph. Then I'm going to plot my inverse in blue here. My inverse is just going to be flipping the x and the y values. So instead of 0, negative 3, I'm going to have negative 3, 0. 1, negative 1 will be negative 1, positive 1, and so on. We're flipping the x and the y values. And then I just plot those. And there is my inverse. Okay, we just swap the x and the y values. So now back to what I was talking about, how graphically we can determine if something has an inverse. Now, the vertical line test, remember, would tell us if a relation is a function. Remember, to pass the vertical line test, it has to draw a vertical line through our graph and only cross once. Horizontal line test is similar, except that it tells us if it has an inverse, if it's a one-to-one -one function. So if I draw a horizontal line through my graph, it should only cross once. So on that part A, x squared minus 2, I'm going to plot that into Desmos really quick. And if we look here, if I were to draw a horizontal line across my graph, it would cross in more than one place. So a parabola where we have an x squared function fails the horizontal line test, and therefore it does not have a relation. It's not a one-to-one -one function. But for part b, that 1 half times x plus 3, that function would pass the horizontal line test. If I drew a horizontal line, it would only cross once. So that is how we determine if a function has an inverse. Now one more thing I want to draw your attention to. This is just um, from an activity we did in class. Um, so this funky Froyo scenario, if I'm writing the equation of the cost to attend this event, so it costs $5 to get in the door, and then it's $0.40 cents per ounce of Froyo that you purchase. Okay, This function is my total cost. And in this case, my input is the ounces, and my output, sorry about that bell, the output is our cost. Our output is money. And if we go down to number five here, we're writing the equation where um, we want to find out how many um, ounces of frozen yogurt we can get based on the number of dollars. And that's actually the inverse of this initial function. So that would be d minus 5 divided by 0.4 and that gives us our ounces. So in this one our inverse, our input is the number of ounces and our output, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself, our input in this case is the money. Our input is the money and our output is the number of ounces. Okay. So when we take the inverse, we are swapping the input and the output. So in the initial function, our input was ounces, our output was money. In the inverse, our input is money, our output is ounces. So taking that into consideration, number two on this back page, we're just given a function h of t where h is our temperature and t is the time passed. So in our initial function h of t, our input is time, the input is time, 
and our output is the temperature. So for part A, if I want to find H of 13, my input here, this is my initial function, my input, that 13, is time. So I'm looking for when time is 13, my output is temperature, my output is 77. Then on part B, I have my inverse of 107. So remember for our inverse, it swaps our input and our output. For our inverse, the input would be temperature and the output would be time. So here my input is 107 and that is a temperature. So I'm looking at 107, my output would be minutes, my time T. So this output is five, okay? And then lastly, that part C there, H, the inverse of 77. Remember, these types of problems we work from the inside out. So starting with inverse of 77. Remember, for inverse, our input is temperature. So that 77 is a temperature, and I'm looking for an output of time. So at 77, my output is 13. So I'm now looking for H of 13. And I'm back to my original function, not the inverse. So my input is going to be a time, and my output's going to be a temperature. So when time is 13, my temperature is 77. So what you just proved here in part C, essentially, is you verify that these are inverses by taking the composition of each other. Remember, f of g of x should give you x if f and g are inverses. In this case, our x is 77. When I took the composition of my inverse, I got that same input, 77. Okay, and that should help you get started on your homework and be successful on the quiz.